Hey there internet friends, a uh, video today for a little let's play uh, that I do with some folks online. Um, if you follow my channel because of the colour stuff I do or the retro NAS stuff I do, um, this is just something different. Normally I don't make these videos public, but I'll make this one public um, just for the fun of it. Uh, this month's uh, retro let's play is chosen by me and I have chosen Castlevania Symphony of the Night. So this video is just a little guide on uh, how to get it up and running for folks who want to emulate it on a PC. I'm going to do that on this Windows 11 desktop I have here. Process is the same for pretty much any Windows. Um, Linux is very similar, um, but you know Linux people probably um, have package managers and things to deal with. But the, this process sort of shows you how to go through, how to grab the files you need and get it up and running. So first things first, let's grab the emulator itself. Um, DuckStation is the emulator. I've got the link here. I'll put the link in the description as well. Um, excellent quality PlayStation 1 emulator, the best one I have ever had the opportunity to play with. Um, I think the, the author has done a fantastic job. Uh, so simply go to the site, uh, head, head up to the releases section here, click on that, uh, scroll down, and for Windows users, you want the uh, Windows X64 release. Don't grab the symbols one that's got the debug symbols in it. Um, you want the regular release one. So just grab that. So I'm going to drop that on my hard drive. I've got a games directory inside there, a PS1 directory, and that can go there. Now we want to grab the game itself. Um, really simple. Uh, archive.org, the online internet archive and the world's best digital library, in my opinion. Um, simply put in the phrase redump PS1. So redump are a group who dump uh, optical images. They specialize in uh, CDs, DVDs, optical drives, those sorts of things. Um, and a lot of people put redump images up on archive.org. Really easy to find them just by searching. So I click here on the first hit. Takes me to uh, this page. If we scroll down, there's a show all button here. So this is the description of what we found, uh, but we're going to hit the show all link here uh, and we'll find a whole bunch of games in here so we can search. Uh, there it is, Symphony of the Night. Uh, you've got the Asian, European and USA version. I'm going to grab the USA version uh, just because that one is uh, 60 hertz full speed, much like the Japanese original. Um, however, it's also in English, which is what I care about. So I'm going to grab that and I'm going to save that to the same directory as I've saved DuckStation. Uh, and then the last bit you need are the PlayStation 1 biases. Um, I've got another link. I'll put all these links in the description. I've got another link here. Um, you can grab those just about anywhere. Um, here's a nice, easy, convenient link to grab that uh, zip file. Uh, and same thing, save it in your PlayStation 1 directory. All right, now to extract all of these, um, I've got the 7-zip extractor on here. Makes it nice and easy for me to extract things. I'm going to put everything in its own directory just to keep it all nice and separate. And I'm going to create a directory in here called games and then put Castlevania there, extract it there. All done. All right, let's run uh, Duck Station. So I'm going to run this uh, QT version here. You'll see there's no GUI. So this is if you want to run DuckStation from a front end, if you have some other third party tool over the top that's going to do all your uh, game handling. I'm going to use uh, DuckStation's internal QT uh, interface because I think it's quite good. Uh, and I'm on a PC anyway, so it makes that nice and easy. Okay, so I've got a blank DuckStation here. Uh, doesn't know anything about the world. Uh, let's go ahead and configure it. So first things first, uh, we have to tell it where to find its uh, BIOS. So go and put in the directory that you dropped your BIOS in. And once you've done that, hit refresh list. If you hit open explorer here, you can just double check. You should see all these uh, SCPH type uh, items. They're all binary files that have the BIOS jumps in them. So they're all there, ready to go. Uh, next, we tell it where to find our games. Add in a games path. Say yes to recursive scan, and what you should see immediately is that the games pop up here. 
Uh, now I've actually extracted the games, which is what you want to do. You'll see the zip file here, which is not what DuckStation is going to read. You can actually delete that uh, if you don't need it. It'll move it out of the way to an archive. Uh, what it expects is for the games to be either in an ISO format or a binq format. So I've got a binq format here. This will also work on uh, Mr. and, and uh, other emulators. Um, you can obviously um, burn them to an optical drive. Uh, you can put them on ODEs if you've got a PlayStation. But yeah, I'm just going to run them this way. Right, time to set up controllers now. If you just go into your settings and look for your USB game controllers. Um, here it says I've got an Xbox 360 controller for Windows. This is actually an 8-bit do controller um, that's just running in Xbox mode, which is probably the easiest for Windows. Um, this is my uh, left thumbstick. This is my right thumbstick. Now, um, thumbsticks don't actually matter for this specific game. This is a, a digital uh, only game. It won't accept analog inputs. Um, games vary some because it's an older game on the PlayStation hardware. It needed um, digital only, and if if you put your um, if you're on a real PlayStation, and you press the analog button on your PlayStation controller, it won't register inputs. It must be in digital mode. So something to be aware of for this specific game. So I'm just going to use the D-pad, which shows up as this hat here, um, and obviously all my buttons um, they're going to be just regular button inputs. We'll we'll set those up in a minute. But yeah, uh, uh, these are my this is my uh, R2 and L2. They show up as a an analog access, but my R uh, my L1 and R1 show up as digital buttons, so they're the ones that pretty much matter for this specific game. Um, let's go and configure all that. So we head over to our controller settings, uh, and again, you definitely want digital controller, not a DualShock analog controller. Um, you want it in digital mode, specific for Symphony of the Night. Other games might be different, you might need to rebind them differently. Let's go and rebind all those. All right, so that's all bound. Uh, memory card settings, just leave these as default. What it'll do is it'll create a memory card per game, uh, which is really cool. Um, what you'll end up with is a, a virtual memory card that's created every time you start a new game. So you never have to worry about running out of space. Um, you know, juggling saves on physical cards was always a problem back in the original PlayStation days. Uh, but this is pretty much like inserting a blank memory card every time you fire up a brand new game for the first time. And then DuckStation remembers that based on the name of the game. So it'll match the name of the bin Q file in the game to the memory card that it's created. Um, and you'll always get those saves back every time you fire up that game on a, on a fresh card, which is really nice. Uh, under your display settings, this is really up to you. I'm going to use Vulkan. I've got an AMD uh, graphics card in this particular system, and I find Vulkan works really well. Um, big fan of that API, I think it's pretty good. Um, you can use different settings here. Um, you know, DirectX 11 and 12 are pretty good. Uh, OpenGL really only sort of fall back, maybe if you've got an, an older um, an older card that doesn't support Vulkan or something like a, an NVIDIA card, an older NVIDIA card that doesn't do very well on it. I recommend Vulkan. Um, a whole bunch of options here uh, in the graphics section. We'll, we'll uh, play with some of these. Um, Later, when we actually see the game in action and we can see what they do. Um, but for now, I'm going to pick a couple of them. Uh, this game has got a fair bit of overscan, so I don't mind leaving crop on this one. Again, we can look at this later on. Um, sometimes selecting none uh, lets you see a little bit more of the game. Uh, in this particular case, it doesn't because it's just all like uh, black borders outside, so it's not really valuable to do that. Um, else. Uh, all these options here I turn on um, just so I can see what's actually, oh not controller input, you can turn that on. It's nice if you're doing like a long play or something or uh, a fighting game where you want people to actually see your moves. Um, I'll turn that off for this time because it's it's pretty simple. Uh, under the enhancement sections here, again we're going to play with a few of these a little bit later on to see what they look like. Uh, I'm going to choose 5 by for 1080p, That's I'm recording here at 1080p. So we'll see what that looks like. And the texture filtering I'm going to set to nearest neighbour, mostly because this is a 2D game. Um, so you don't really want um, any of the filtering going on for 2D games. If you've got a 3D game, sometimes it can look better. I think this looks a lot better just with sharp pixels. Up to you, though. 
Um, I'm going to turn on true color rendering. And down here, I'm going to turn on a couple of these uh, options. And again, we will see what they do uh, later on. The, the geometry correction one is an interesting one. It changes whether you get the uh, the wobbly polygons, like it says down the bottom there, reduce wobbly polygons. Um, it can have some interesting effect on 2D games. So we'll play around with those a little bit later um, and see how they look. I head over to my console settings here. Uh, there's a few options here to speed up the CD-ROM reading. Um, obviously, um, this particular game is running off a bin queue on a local disk, so there's no point really uh, treating it like a real CD-ROM. Uh, however, it, this is really game specific. Um, so you can get really nice fast loading times on some games uh, if they can deal with it. I found Symphony of the Night can't really. Um, if you speed things up too quickly here, um, it can get a bit crashy. My, I don't know if it's my system, I don't know if it's the version of Duck Station I'm using or what, but Symphony of the Night specifically is no good. I've had other PS1 games through Duck Station where you can really turn these up really high. Uh, has no impact on gameplay whatsoever and you just end up with a a really nice zippy fast loading time, but I'm going to leave all these as default just to keep this game happy. All right, time to run the game. Double click. PlayStation BIOS screen. And again, this is going to take a little while because we've got the CD-ROM set to real-time mode. It's not going to be running in um, in accelerated mode. So again, uh, this has to be in digital mode. If you get to this screen and you push the button that you've assigned to start uh, and nothing happens, very likely you've got yours running uh, analog mode, which means it won't work. So I'm going to... No, I'm not. Oh, yep. Uh, this is my virtual memory card that's picked up. It said that there's nothing in here. Uh, all my slots are empty. You can have lots and lots of games, obviously. Um, pick any old slot. Um, give yourself a name. Okay. So we start this game uh, where the previous game uh, left off. Which I'll explain in the thread a little bit. Not too many spoilers here. I just want to show a couple of sections off. Alright, uh, I forgot all my moves, there we go. So, one of the things to notice here, it's pretty interesting, this clock tower in the background, look at that dance, that's pretty crazy. I'm not sure what causes that effect, and I think it actually even happens on... Um, on real hardware, you just don't notice it as much with the way that the CRT blending and low resolution affects it. Um, but I guess what I really want to show off here um, is the sharp pixels. So I've got nice sharp pixels here, but the background elements, they are 3D, so they've got uh, quite a bit uh, different kind of look, they're much sharper. Um, if we're going to full screen mode, it's sort of a bit more pronounced, I guess. Uh, again, you can see me up here, I've got a nice sort of solid... Oh, I can't move my mouse. Um, up the top right there, you can see I'm sort of uh, locked in at that 59 point something frames per second, pretty close to 60 frames per second. It does not exactly 60 for NTSC reasons. Um, but you can tell there it's all looking pretty good. So uh, Alt-Enter to get out of full screen mode. I'm just going to fiddle with my settings so we can see the effect of different options. So if I go to my display settings here, um, I can see if I look at my crop and get rid of that, you can see it kind of shrinks the game a little bit. I can look at all borders or I can just go to overscan area. So again, because this has got like a pretty thick black border around it, uh, that works pretty good. Uh, integer upscaling changes the scaling ever so slightly. Um, it makes sure that it's either it's a, a perfect uh, integer scale. Um, and I think, you, I don't know if you can see it with um, the video compression that's going on, but uh, with that turned on, it's much sharper. So I quite like this particular game nice and sharper. Um, your linear upscaling as well, um, that puts a bilinear filter on things. It only really matters depending on the uh, resolution that you've cho chosen. So I go into my enhancement settings here, change this down to say one by. 
going to uh, figure all that out again. You can definitely see like it hasn't made much of a difference to my actual sprite because it's still um, scaling that, but you can see the clock tower in the background is totally different. So uh, up to you, like some people do like that. Some people like the lower resolution for the uh, entire game, including the 2D and 3D assets. Really will depend on whether or not you're playing a 2D game or a 3D game and you know what all the different bits and pieces look like together, which is kind of interesting. Um, but if I then head back to my display settings and choose a linear upscale here, you can see it's put a bilinear filter over that 2D element and blurred that. So again, up to you whether you like that or not. Uh, I don't, I like it nice and sharp. Um, integer scaling there I think looks pretty good. But again, that clock tower is pretty low resolution in the background. So I don't mind setting this nice and high to get that nice sharp uh, look in the background there. Totally up to you um, how you do that. Now, if I go to my enhancement settings again, um, there's a couple other things. If I turn on this depth buffer here, uh, that messes with, you can see the clouds now are kind of in front of this element, which should be in the foreground. So that kind of breaks the game, which is not really good. Uh, so I'll turn that off. There's also a few other breakages here, I think, where... Alright, so let's uh, leave that alone. Uh, no, I don't want that cross, or do I? Secret uh, room up here somewhere. Monster, you don't belong in this world. It was not by my hand that I'm once again given. If you hold tab, you can actually fast forward through all this, which is kind of nice if you don't care about story. That's the easiest battle ever. Alright, so same same, I'm going to fast forward through all this just by holding the tab key here. I'm on a pretty uh, decent laptop, so I've got about 800% speed here, which is nice. Now we switch characters. Uh, fast forward through this as well. We're into uh, the a la carte portion uh, of the game. To one bit here where we mix 2D and 3D elements as well. Yeah. 
if you are playing this game for the first time. It's not bad just to hang around in this early area and kill lots of bad guys. It does level you up pretty quickly, gets you ready for some later battles. Going off a couple of secrets as I go. Alright, and here we meet Death. Uh, here's a little chat to you. And he steals all your toys and runs away, so now you are useless. Um, if we hit the start button here, we go into our menu. Um, and we go into equipment and we see that I don't have much at all. I've got uh, I've got a neutron bomb, which is kind of fun. Um, but no weapons, uh, just a couple of pot roasts, no armor, anything like that. So that's kind of fun. You might have noticed too that my shiny red cape is gone. I now have a very dull cape. Thanks to death stealing everything. I'm gonna go and take on some bad guys here with just my empty hands. Alright, got a sword that I just picked up. Let's equip that in one of my hands. So you've got two attack buttons. One hand for one, one hand for the other, unless you've got a two-handed weapon, then it sits in both hands. I'm going to go into this save room here. And just because I want to show off what's going on here. This is another example of some 2D and 3D elements mixed. Down in my settings, um, let's turn off uh, all this stuff and see pretty quickly what goes on. So you can see here that the 3D elements got that classic PlayStation wobble. Uh, likewise, if I set my resolution very low, back to sort of PlayStation 1 style graphics here, uh, which you know you might like, uh, up to you. I like kind of my 2D uh, nice and sharp and pixely and my 3D uh, not too bad there. I turn on geometry correction because I quite like the the lack of wobbliness. Yeah, a couple of other options here. So this preserve proje uh, projection precision again is like one step better for the for the old uh, wobbly stuff. Um, again, play around with these. You might find that they result in artifacting. You might find that they don't. It really is game dependent. Um, yeah, but anywho, uh, head to one of these weird looking things and push up and you'll save your game. And you'll see a little note up the top there that the game saved. Alright, so that's saved. So once the game saved, obviously uh, you can come back to it and load that save like you normally would. Another option is to use save states. Uh, so if I load, I'd load up from this room. But let's hop out to this uh, room right here. Um, if I take a save state, save state also happens uh, when you exit the game. Uh, so for any reason, if I close the whole duck station, uh, reopen it, it'll pick up from where I left off in that game. Don't rely on that though. Things get crashy, they're no good. So best probably just to like choose a save state every time. So here's me out in the hall. If I go back here and load my previous save state, I'm back out in that hall again. That's it in terms of actually uh, getting the emulator up and running. Um, I'll discuss the rest of the game and the intricacies of how it all works in the Overclocker thread. If you want to join me in there to uh, talk about it and talk about your progress, I'll try and keep the spoilers pretty low. Um, but yeah, that's the kind of the, the technical bits aside to get you up and running at least on Duck Station. Okay, one other thing we can do, um, which is purely a subjective thing, uh, like any of these visual sort of filters are, if we head into our settings and go to our post-processing settings here, um, we've got a couple of options. Um, there's some, you know, bloom and brightness gamma type settings. I'm going to leave all those alone. You can play with those. Um, scan lines is a, an interesting one. People like the scan lines sometimes, sometimes they don't. Um, if I get out of this menu and in the gameplay area, you can sort of see what the effect the scan lines have. Um, the scan lines themselves, you can edit them. There are a couple of different types. There's these horizontal ones, some vertical ones, which doesn't make a lot of sense with this game. There are vertical PlayStation games, but this is not one of them. Uh, and then this uh, last type kind of puts like a grid kind of pattern, almost like an LCD screen. Um, if you were playing on a, on a handheld, a PlayStation Portable or something, that doesn't look too bad. Looks okay. Um, you've got like these uh, intensity sliders of how uh, how much uh, scan line data versus uh, the black line data is there. Likewise, you've got these spacing options. Uh, this gets pretty wild if you uh, have various uh, integer levels. You can end up with some wacky effects. Uh, if anything goes wrong, obviously hit the restore defaults button to get yourself back to safety. So yeah, again, really subjective whether or not you like scan lines or sharp pixels or uh, blur. Um, you know, you can you can mix and match some of that um, bilinear filtering that I was showing you with some of the scan line effects. You might like that instead of the sharp pixels. 100% uh, up to you.
how you want to do that. Um, I won't go any more into this stuff, the equipment, spells, relic systems, familiars, I'll, I'll talk about that more in Thread. So if you want to join me in Thread for more of an explanation about how all that works or if you've got any questions about that, let me know. Uh, but hopefully this at least gets you up and running with uh, DuckStation, the DuckStation BIOS files uh, and the game itself to get you started on the journey of enjoying this pretty pivotal game in the history of uh, the Metroidvania genre of gaming. Anyway, I'll chat to you on Thread. See ya.